This week, we're taking a look at the new beta release of Gato 4.4. GatoCon makes its way to the US for the very first time, and you can survive a PS1 style horror game in five games made in Gato. I'm Stay at Home Dev, and it's this week in Gato. It was just announced this week that GatoCon will also be held in the US. From May 5th to 7th, GatoCon will be held in Boston, Massachusetts. So if you haven't been able to go to a GatoCon because it's been held in Europe and you're in the States like me, you can finally go. Now, as far as I know, tickets haven't been announced yet, so keep an eye out for that. They are taking submissions for speakers and sponsors. The deadline for that is the 23rd of February. I'm super excited and I hope to see you guys there. In other Gato Engine news, the 4.4 beta number one was released. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how these releases go, typically in a release cycle, for example, 4.4, there are a huge amount of changes added to the engine. Those changes go through a beta process where they're tested. That's what we're in now. Then we'll go into the release candidate process. And after that, a stable release. So we're still a little bit away from a 4.4 stable, but we have a really good idea of what that's going to look like, including but not limited to a short list of things that I found really exciting. One of the bigger ones that was actually sponsored by W4 Games is the Game Embed tab. In the past, the Gato Engine has run a new window for that, and that kind of creates some frustrations with clicking on, clicking off. It's layered on top of the editor. It wasn't the best. Well, now you can run your game in the editor with the Game Embed tab. Some other additions include vertex shading, for those of you looking for a more retro look to your 3D games, 3D physics interpolation, which has been in 2D for a little bit now. The image import plugin has been made a lot faster. So if you've ever uploaded a HDR image for a sky or something similar, it used to take a long time. We're talking minutes here, which actually isn't really that long a time, but relatively longer. That time is a lot shorter now thanks to the new import plugin. Another cool change that I really like, if you've ever been frustrated by having to scroll all the way down to get to the transform options and the inspector tab, well, now you can just pin your favorite properties and they'll stay up at the top. Not too long ago, typed arrays were added. And if you don't know what I mean by typed, I just mean static typed. And if you don't know what static type means, Basically, you're telling the engine what a variable is without it having to guess. So we could do that with arrays, but we couldn't do it with dictionaries. Well, in 4.4, we can. They also added some 3D visualization updates to the 3D particles. Now you know where your, your bounding box is for your particle systems. You can also move around a 3D object and have it automatically snap to other objects in your scene. And a somewhat controversial update, they've added UIDs. This really has to do with how the engine manages and handles your files in your directory. There were occasions where if you made a change to a file or, or added a file and the engine wasn't open or was open, there were opportunities for everything to crash. I won't go super deep into UIDs, but basically files were stored or, or looked at based on their file path. If the file path changed and the engine wasn't open, things got a little confusing. Now files will have a UID and the engine can reference that instead of the file path. For the most part, you're not gonna notice this change at all. The only thing you really need to remember is to include the UID files in any version controlling that you're doing. It's actually a little similar to how the, the import process goes. If you've ever gone to a project folder, you see the file, but you also see the little .import file it's kind of like that. There are some that are worried that this is gonna sort of bloat projects and it's gonna add more files, but you're not gonna see those files necessarily. There's actually a really nice post explaining what they're doing, why they're doing it, and why they didn't do other things. Uh, I'm gonna link to that in the description and you can kind of decide for yourself. All in all, I think it's a good change for the engine. Now, if this whole game development thing is feeling a little overwhelming for you and you need something a little bit more structured, then the sponsor of this video, SNHU, might be your answer. Southern New Hampshire University, or SNHU, has one of the largest accredited online degree offerings in the United States, and yes, they offer online degrees in game development. So instead of searching for random tutorials on YouTube or struggling to learn everything yourself, you can jump right into a planned out degree in the comfort of your own home. The program covers AI, physics, 2D and 3D graphics, UI design, and more. You'll dive headfirst into programming languages like C++ or C Sharp. Learn to work with game engines, and if you're more artistic, 
Hone your skills in 3D modeling and game art design with tools used by professionals in the industry. You can go to snhu.edu slash stay at home to get free information right now just by email. And if you're interested in a game development online degree, SNHU will connect you with a representative to hop on a call and walk you through the game dev program and answer any questions you might have. For the Gato tip of the week, we're actually going to be looking at one of the features of the 4.4 beta that I'm really excited about, and that's the game embed tab. To me, this is going to make it a lot cleaner to just work in the editor. You don't have a bunch of separate windows whenever you test your game, but it also makes it easier to test specific things while you run your game. And I'm going to show you what I mean. So I've opened up my um, water shader project that I had in, in 4.3. I've updated that to 4.4. And if you download the 4.4 beta, you're going to get this new tab up here uh, called Game. If you click on the Game tab, it's actually going to ask you to press play to start the game. So whenever you press play, instead of it running in a separate window, it's going to run it right here in that tab. Now within this project, I don't actually have a controller or anything. It's just a shader test. At the top of the tab, you have a couple of options. You can play or suspend your scene. You can also go to the next frame of your scene if you're testing something that's really specific to a frame change, for example. Next, you have an option to allow game input. So if you had a, a player character that you're using or some inputs like a menu, you can turn that off and on with that option. To the right, you have options for 2D nodes and 3D nodes. If I click the 2D option, it's gonna let me select those in the editor right here. Now I don't have any 2D nodes, but I do have 3D nodes. So let's click on that 3D option. And now we can click on our cylinder here. You'll notice that it highlights it as if we were working within the editor. And it also brings it up over here in the inspector. Now, this process was already available if you had it in a different window. It just wasn't really easy to get to. But now you've got your game running within the editor. You can click on aspects of your scene and it's gonna show up right here on the right. You can also adjust these things live in the game. So let's say I wanted to make this sphere over here maybe a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. Those changes are going to happen live in the editor as I adjust them in the inspector. We also have this uh, camera button over here. Now this is going to allow you to override whatever camera is currently set in your scene. So by clicking that, we can actually move around in our scene separate from our in-game camera nodes. Now while this is running, you can also go back to the 3D tab and make an adjustment as if you were editing your scene or your game. And that edit is going to show up in the game tab. In conclusion, I love the game embed tab. I think it's going to make the process of making games a lot more efficient, and it's going to open up some cool ideas and features for future releases. Now let's take a look at this week's games. How does a quiet night shift turn into a deadly race against time? In the patient, Dr. Ellen Reed returns from maternity leave only to discover one of her 10 inpatients was mistakenly dosed with a dangerous mutative drug. With the psychiatric wing plunged into darkness by a power outage, she must reconstruct lost patient files, track anomalies, and unlock the file room for vital clues. Tense exploration and puzzle solving unfold in a dimly lit basement where each flickering light could betray your progress. Armed with nothing but limited records in a single mission, identify and stop the infected patient before it's too late, Ellen's only hope lies in unraveling the hospital secrets under the eerie glow of a retro PS1 horror aesthetic. Number two. A warrior king stands at the crossroads of loyalty and freedom in Cedric and Odious, a pixel art action RPG steeped in dark fantasy. Created by a solo developer over five years, it features what were once steadfast friends, Cedric and the brilliant sorcerer Odious now share a twisted bond, with Cedric bound to the necromancer's will. Floating platforms in a diverse landscape force you to strategize, while a host of brutal enemies, from wildling clans to demonic horrors, test your skill at every turn. Offered as a totally free game, it challenges you to decide whether to obey a corrupt savior or defy him, and embrace death once more. Number three. Set in 1988, The Root Trees Are Dead blends sleuthing with the nostalgic quirks of dial-up internet. Armed with your trusty modem, you'll sift through photos, articles, and other relics of the late 90s to piece together the messy family tree behind the billion-dollar Root Tree Corporation. Each clue eliminates potential leads, but also leads to fresh twists as you inch closer to naming the true blood relatives. 
The enhanced Steam version adds hand-drawn art, a 3D living room interface, quality of life improvements, and fully voiced cinematics. An extra campaign, Root Tree Mania, also uncovers more sordid secrets of the Maple Candy Empire in an all-new Family Tree Challenge. There's no telling what lurks around every corner in Kirker, a procedurally generated FPS roguelike dripping with danger. As a power-hungry adventurer, you'll brave formidable enemies, navigate hidden traps, and barter with greedy shopkeepers to expand your wealth. Sequences of dungeon floors offer ever-shifting objectives and challenges, rewarding those who survive with exclusive weapons and synergistic abilities. And keep an eye out because sharp-eyed explorers can uncover secret rooms filled with beautiful, beautiful loot. Just remember, death strips away all of your progress, so each run truly tests your might and your luck. And before we get to our last spot, congrats to last week's winner, Dragon Gate. Be sure to vote for your favorite in the comments to have them included in this year's Gato Game Awards. And like last year, just because a game doesn't win its week doesn't mean it can't be included in the awards. Number five. Tranquility is mixed with cunning puzzle design in The Legend of Lumina, a Sokoban-inspired adventure with Metroidvania-style progression. Inspired by early Zelda titles, yet swapping swordplay for block pushing, this serene forest world hides roughly 50 interconnected areas, each layered with puzzles. Many challenges can be solved in different ways, rewarding keen observation and flexible thinking. And as you delve deeper, you'll uncover lost secrets and attempt to break the curse looming over the land. 